We begin the day with a president looking east. Vladimir Putin hosted the Eastern Economic Forum in Russia's port city of Vladivostok today. It was an attempt to find new allies and firm up existing friendships as Moscow turns to Asia in the face of unprecedented Western sanctions over the war in Ukraine. At the same time, he began to burn whatever bridges were still left with the West. In a bellicose appearance, Putin threatened to turn his back on the UN-brokered grain deal, cut off energy supplies to Europe, and insisted that despite economic pressure and terrible losses on the battlefield, his country was doing just fine. I think, I'm sure, we haven't lost anything, and we won't lose anything. Russia is coping with the economic, financial and technological aggression of the West. I'm talking about aggression, there's no other word for it. Foreign currency exchanges and stock exchanges have stabilized. Inflation is down. Unemployment is at an all-time low. Some want to isolate Russia. But as we've always said, that is impossible. You only need to look at the map. It is probably worth thinking about limitations on grain exports and other foodstuffs to Europe. I will definitely consult the president of Turkey, Mr. Erdogan, on this matter. You asked about caps on our energy prices. That is an absolutely stupid idea. If someone tries to implement it, it will not lead to anything good for them. Well, as if to underline their differences, just hours after Putin said a price cap on Russian gas would be stupid, the European Union said it was considering just that. It wants to set a limit on what buyers can pay for Russian gas imports. The aim is to help households and businesses struggling to pay their energy bills. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen said Putin's blackmail had to stop. We aim at lowering the costs of gas. And therefore, we will propose a price cap on Russian gas. Of course, the objective is here very clear. We all know that our sanctions are deeply grinding into the Russian economy with a heavy negative impact. But Putin is partially buffering through fossil fuel revenues. So here, the objective is we must cut Russia's revenues, which Putin uses to finance his atrocious war in Ukraine. My first guest is Samuel Romani. He teaches politics and international relations at the University of Oxford in the UK. He's also the author of the upcoming book, Putin's War on Ukraine. It examines why Putin opted for all-out regime change in Ukraine and looks at the future implications of the invasion. Mr. Romani, welcome. So good to see you. We saw a very defiant Putin again today. He even said that Russia had lost nothing in launching the war. What do you make of that? Well, I think that's the message that he has to convey. He's always been trying to convey the messages the sanctions that have been imposed on Russia are going to boomerang and have unintended consequences that are much stronger on the West, especially in the energy sphere in terms of freezing of Europe. And also, Russia has shielded its immense military losses. It hasn't reported officially on casualties since the end of March, and the casualties are running now at 15 to 20,000 at the lowest, and they're now at risk of losing territory in Kurzan, whereas the Russians admit that the counteroffensive that Ukraine is launching is not sustainable. So he has a lot to cover up. The truth is, and um, I think that's fair to say, that Russia hasn't gained anything in the past six months. How big of a miscalculation has the invasion been for Putin? Well, the invasion of Ukraine has been a good uh, calculation for Putin only on one scope. It's uh, consolidated the, his regime. I mean, the public is behind the war for the most part, at least in the short term. The liberal opposition has been quashed. The Naval Navalny's and Karamutsas are in jail. And uh, the hybrid narrative of, of this total war of aggression from the West against Russia has been quite compelling at home. But aside from that, the war has been catastrophic for Russia. They've uh, suffered sanctions that even their own internal reports suggest may not lead to a full recovery of the Russian GDP by the end of the decade, even if the initial crash was uh, less than feared. They've lost access to military technology to replenish their weapon stocks. And they've only gained Kurzon and Luhansk, and even Kurzon's under threat. 
Those sanctions are precisely the reason Russia is looking to pivot towards the East. Uh, but only two countries sent top representatives to the Economic Forum in Vladivostok today. Are Asian countries more reluctant to engage with Moscow than Putin would like to believe at this stage? Well, that's the eternal question for Putin, because Putin's been talking about multipolarity in a really intense way almost ever since he took over the presidency, and especially since 2014 when they first annexed Crimea. But aside from uh, major deals in the defense spheres and in terms of extractive, so mineral and oil resources, these non-Western powers have not really given significant security assistance to Russia when Russia might, might need it. Like, uh, for example, China has not helped Russia with the war in Ukraine, and also large-scale investments in Russia's economic development. And what we're seeing at the Eastern Economic Forum is that inability to convert rhetoric and transactional relationships into truly deep, long-term strategic partnerships. So it's telling that Li Jianxu, the China's number three, is the only person there, and Russia is having to sign its most consequential deals at the forum with Myanmar's junta. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's quite telling. And let's keep talking about China, because the relationship between Putin and Xi Jinping is, is quite fascinating. Uh, both are going to meet for the first time face-to-face -face next week. Uh, Putin has described the two countries' relationship as having no limits, and Beijing refuses to condemn the invasion of Ukraine. What exactly is China's role in the conflict? Well, I think China's role in the conflict shows that it's a close partnership, but it actually has limits, unlike what Putin has been saying. The Chinese have uh, not condemned Russia. They have said that condemning Russia is deleterious to diplomacy and peace, and that's a position that you see many others in the global south, like uh, India, the Arab League, and the African Union, and many of its member states also take. So that's not uh, unusual. And they've also launched an information war against the West that uh, blames the war on NATO expansion and covers up some of Russia's worst war crimes, like we saw in Bucha. And they've uh, purchased a significant amount of coal and uh, oil and gas. But aside from that, they've not provided any kind of military assistance towards uh, Russia in terms of uh, major uh, infrastructure and uh, technological projects like cars and aviation parts. They've actually been reducing their sales and not supplying the, those sort of parts. And their major state-owned companies, including Huawei, have moved their employees to other countries like Kazakhstan or have been wary about investing in new projects because of the fear of secondary sanctions. So there is a strong partnership which China does not want to criticize Russia, but again, it lacks strategic depth and it's certainly a limited partnership, not a no limits one. Hmm. Another topic Putin hmm. touched on during the foreman was uh, the grain deal. Why is he threatening to tear up the agreement? Well, the Green Deal, first of all, was not meant to be permanent, at least from the Russian point of view. It was 120 days until November, and then it would be assessed, and then the decision would be made to renew it. And the Russians are threatening to uh, scrap the deal uh, obliquely, but now I think it's getting more prominent from Lavrov, from the UN, and now from Putin for a couple of reasons. First of all, they feel that sanctions are still blocking Russia from supplying fertilizer freely on international markets, even though the West denies that. There are also sanctions of Belarusian potash, which are another complication. But the West also makes that not to be a big deal. The second thing is that Russian grain has not really been moving out of the ports in Ukraine as quickly as, as they would like. They allege now not even one ship has moved. And thirdly, it's also about PR. The Russians want to show that Ukraine is reselling uh, grain to rich countries and is trying to profit off of this and not really fulfill its obligations, which is to give money, to, uh, give grain to the uh, poorest countries, particularly in Africa. And that's a very misleading charge, because even when Ukraine has resold grain to Sweden and the United States, it's gone to countries like Ethiopia. And Ukraine just dispatched 28,600 tons of grain to Somalia. So it's a mixture of PR and also Russia trying to protect its own interests. And if it's having problems with exports, it's blaming them on sanctions, fairly or unfairly. All right, so you don't think we're going to see another Russian blockade in the Black Sea? So from Russian contacts I've been speaking to, I had none, none of them have been uh, telling me that uh, they would like to uh, end the deal. I think they just want to kind of renegotiate its terms in some ways. And uh, they want to do that not through Turkey and uh, or through a or through informal mediation process likely chaired by Turkey, but through the original uh, guarantors of the agreement, which is the United Nations. And that's what Sergei Lavrov made very clear in his speech yesterday. He would appeal to the UN and not to the Western backers of Ukraine, who would never really be at the table in a more informal setting.